I was 19 years old the first time I ever attended a Southern Baptist church for worship on Mother's Day Sunday. You'll recall that Mother's Day is not a liturgical holiday. It's a Hallmark holiday, but that distinction didn't exist there. Also, I didn't know what the word liturgical meant yet, but that's another matter. The church I attended that day was located in rural North Louisiana, and I was visiting the family of a boyfriend for the weekend and worshiping at his parents' church. I also think to, it was safe to say that I had not spent that much time at all pondering the intricacies of gender and the social constructs that impact the way all of us unconsciously think about gender and the way the systems that serve or don't serve us reinforce those constructs. Let's face it, at that point in my life, I was doing well to make it to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. chemistry class. I do recall, however, sitting up and taking notice, outraged in the best way my 19-year-old self could be, when the pastor talked about what it meant to be a good woman, which we all knew obviously meant being a mother, first of all. And dinner on the table every night, he said, a clean house at all times, well-behaved children, and don't ever, under any circumstances, go to the grocery store with curlers in your hair. This memory came to mind as I turned to the task of sermon preparation this week, recalling that today is Father's Day, which, by the way, is also not a liturgical holiday. It's a Hallmark holiday, too. Some of you might remember that three years ago on Father's Day, I preached a sermon called Hysterical. In that sermon, I tried to retell the story of the biblical character Sarah finding out she was going to have a baby at age 90. My point was that perhaps our impressions of Sarah laughing hysterically at the news of her unlikely pregnancy have been shaped by the male voices who have told her story for thousands of years. What would you and I think of Sarah if we'd heard the story from her point of view? Well. In the week following that sermon, I got several emails and comments from people who had been in attendance that Sunday expressing their dismay over the fact that I'd preached a sermon about a woman on Father's Day. I should have preached a sermon about how to be a good man, they all suggested. And so today, you'll note the sermon title, How to Be a Good Man. Here's the conundrum for the preacher today. The passage for consideration is, again, the words of a woman. I didn't do it. It's woman wisdom, the feminine expression of God, and here we are. And so I regret to say the topic for today, how to be a good man, is once again informed by the commentary of a woman. The passage we heard today comes from the book of Proverbs, the book of wise sayings written by King Solomon. And the portion for today is about wisdom, that essential quality that offers us signposts for living, guides to touch on as we navigate the difficult task of being human in the world. And in the book of Proverbs, well, wisdom is a woman. She's this fascinating feminine expression of God, depicted as a partner in God's great work of dreaming the world into being and then making it happen. Today, you'll remember, she's calling out, raising her voice, standing right in the middle of the gates, in the middle of town, where all the decisions are made and where all the power is brokered. There she is, right in the center of power and she has some things to say to everyone who's passing by, a few words about what it takes to live in this world successfully. Now, I'm a pretty pessimistic person, but I really don't think the architects of our lectionary readings were trying to make it especially hard for the preacher on Father's Day. The reason that we read about this more unusual biblical expression of God is because today is also Trinity Sunday. It's the Sunday right after Pentecost, the day when the Spirit shows up, 
And everybody's kind of wondering, though we don't want to say out loud because it's kind of impolite, how many gods do we worship exactly? There's Jesus, of course, but he floated away on Transfiguration Sunday two weeks ago. And then last week, the Spirit came, and we know about God the Father, as everyone calls him. So could somebody please explain this? Yeah, well, people have been trying to explain this for thousands of years. This God is three in one, but really one, even though God is also three idea. The fathers of the early church, like Augustine of Hippo, wrote in his great and cumbersome work, The City of God, deeply unhelpful statements like, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and finally, there is only one God. From 325 A.D. all the way to 451 A.D., the church argued over 100 years. The arguments are complicated and multi-layered, and I'm happy to give you details if you want to learn more. Suffice it to say that while all of this seems humorous now, believe me, this arguing was no joke. People were kicked out of the church and labeled heretics. Fancy theological words were created to define the essence of the different parts of the Trinity, and centuries were spent trying to define God. And here we are over 2,000 years later with no more easy answers than they had back then. On Trinity Sunday, it's not the preacher's job or our job to explain the essence of God because God is a mystery. Instead, it's our work to try to learn the essence of the one in whose image we are created and then live with brave abandon into the truth of who we're meant to be. And who we're meant to be, according to this little picture of God that we can see, the picture we've decided to call the Trinity, is a people whose basic character is defined by relationship. And so today we meet woman wisdom who says it over and over again, painting with a delicate brush the beautiful nuances of her partnership with God. To her, the beauty of being in relationship involves a perpetual awe at all of the goodness around us because there's a lot. Angie says, who we're created to be is fundamentally collaborative. All of us working together at every opportunity because we know that we can do so much more that is so much better if we do it in partnership. We're not against each other. We're ever and always for each other. And that's a beautiful way to live. A beautiful way to live. And woman wisdom is out there in the middle of the street insisting that no matter where we are or what we're doing, we always look at one another and recognize the spark of the divine in every single person. The potential for relationship that makes us stronger and better, that makes the world around us a healthier place for everyone, that makes all of our interactions less about what's in it for me and more about how can we all thrive together. And even though it's a woman who's saying it, it seems to me that her advice is true and sound. Awe, oh, partnership, respect. These are the qualities that characterize the life of a good man. As you know, June is Pride Month. We've been talking here about God and gender identity, and we've had our understanding of gender stretched, perhaps in the same way that the doctrine of the Trinity invites us into the mystery of who God is, because it's important to remember, of course, that God is not male or female, 
and that all the beautiful expressions of gender that exist in our human experience spring from one source, the divine. In the news this week, there's been an assault of stories about the Southern Baptist Convention, one of the largest Christian denominations in the United States, meeting this week and struggling to deal with their refusal to allow women equal authority in church leadership, along with the shameful reality of sexual abuse in Southern Baptist churches. What seems so obvious and deeply heartbreaking is that these two issues are directly connected. This kind of abuse is what happens when we use gender constructs as bludgeons because we inevitably hurt each other. Look, I know it's Father's Day, and it's not a liturgical holiday, and despite what the Southern Baptist Convention might suggest, the Bible doesn't really lay out a list of what it takes to be a good man. Here's what I know. I know that male suicide in America is rising at such an alarming rate that it has been classified as a silent epidemic. I know that men who are vocal about mental health struggles are dismissed as weak, ostracized for their honesty, told to man up, and that happens acutely with men of color. That's wrong, and it's dangerous, and these kinds of categories, they're killing us. They're killing us. Perhaps the question for today, or any day created to celebrate different expressions of God, or the different roles that we fill in life, isn't how to be a good man, or woman, or father, or mother, or any other gendered expression of how people are supposed to behave. Perhaps the better question for today is, what does it mean to be a good person? How do we show up every day and live faithfully in this world who we were created to be? Because the ways that we categorize each other are making us hurt each other instead of following the advice of woman wisdom and bringing ourselves into collaborative community. Instead of a search for balance and integration, we create a struggle for dominance. We insist on divisions and we deny interdependence. This dualism of power, it's destroying us. It's a dualism of superior, inferior, Ruler, ruled, owner, owned, user, used, and that's wrong. And it's in complete contrast to what God imagines for us, to what God has modeled for us in the mystery of the Trinity. When we use our ideas about God and the religious structures that represent God to pigeonhole each other into predefined categories designed to limit power and influence, we are doing exactly opposite of what woman wisdom was asking us to do. When she stood out there at the intersection of power, at the gates of the city, at the crossroads of the highway, and called out her best advice for living, her advice, and the lesson to learn on Trinity Sunday is the lesson that we are better together. God, three in one, exists in relationship, collaboration, and we do nothing less than that because we live healthier, sounder, more promising human lives when we work not toward categorizing and separating, but toward integration with integrity toward authentic relationship. I think it's safe to say that the words of woman wisdom and Proverbs today have very little to do with being a good man and pretty much everything to do with being a good human in partnership with each other, not competition or categorization. That's when beautiful things are born. Friends, just look around you and see what God has made. So much beauty in all of you. 
Why would we categorize it into oblivion? It seems to me that our efforts to do that would be an affront to the very idea of the Trinity, the mystery and the beauty of God. Instead, here's what I have to say on Father's Day. You go right ahead and wear your curlers to the grocery store. <laughs> if you're struggling with depression, talk about it. Do whatever it is that pushes back at the categories that keep us separated from each other because we need one another. The miserly distinctions we continue to insist upon will surely be the end of us. God, three in one, is standing at the crossroads at the city gates where everyone passes by, begging us to think and dream instead about how much better we can be together. And perhaps, though of course we all know it's not a liturgical holiday, this may be the best way of all to celebrate Father's Day. Amen.